I want to talk today, we're going to continue in Romans chapter 8, about walking in the Spirit, or really um, not walking, uh, walking with or without the Spirit, you might would say. And what is very obvious to me, I mean, the Lord has hit me like, you ever, hopefully you've never felt this before, um, but have you ever been hit with a board or a pipe? Um, <laughs> Whether you intentionally, not saying somebody swung it at you, but you just ran into something. I remember Hannah very proudly one day as a seventh grader made the soccer team and she was lapping the other girls around the field and she was looking back at them and she ran right into the goalpost, knocked herself out. That's a true story, just doing like that. Luckily, I don't have the knot this morning, but something's very clear to me from conversation and counsel before church to a Sunday school class led by a brother Benny and the conversation um, to, uh, to, to just what I know the Lord's laid upon my heart right now. And it has totally to do with where we are in Scripture and how things have been aligned. As Brother Jeff talked in communion meditation and, and the very songs that we sung and the message that was behind Hannah's song. And uh, I just think God's going to do something amazing today. So let's be looking for it. Okay, Jep, uh, Jep made a comment, or excuse me, not Jep, uh, Brother John made a comment about seeing God. We may not see his physical body, but we see God every day. Amen? And um, I, I just want to see him today in each and everything we do. So let me get into the Word where the real power is. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time. And God, I thank you for ordaining us right to this place, God, for the many things that are taking place in our church congregation, in our families, from sickness to death to challenges, challenges with our job, challenges with, with our, our spouses, challenges with our children, to uh, God, just, just worry and, and uh, guilt that comes upon each one of us, God, in relationship with you. There's, there's so many things, God. We come brokenhearted. We come full of celebration. We come in all all kinds of ways, and God, the beauty is you bring us. And in the midst of a group unified in the name of Jesus, God, you do something individually for each one of us, and at the same time, bless us corporately for being together. That's you, God. And I just ask you to speak through the message today. God, may there just be less of me in more of you. May there be power in your word. May we gain new understanding. May it change our lives. God, would you allow your Holy Spirit to meet us wherever we are and invite us closer. And God, for the one or few or many that listen to this, and do not know you as their Lord and Savior. May they see the need for a Savior today. And would they answer that call, the call of your Holy Spirit? And would your Holy Spirit just fill them? It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Quickly in front of you, three applications from last week. Application number one, there is now, Romans 8, 1, no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, meaning we are in a relationship with God through Christ Jesus. Application number two from last week, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. That goes all together. The law, the principle of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free. What in the world has it freed us from? Uh, Romans chapter 2, verse, uh, excuse me, chapter 8, verse 2, verse 3, verse 4 talks about uh, what, what we can't do with our own flesh. What is it making us free from? From us uh, attempting or trying to be perfect by following the law, which we know we cannot do. It's made us free from that. In fact, application number 3 says that the Holy Spirit inside of every believer fulfills the righteousness of, of the law. How are we made free? Because we cannot accomplish the law good enough on our own. We will fall short. There is none righteous. No, not one. We're all guilty. We fall short of the love of God. And it is only by God's love and what He's done 
done through Jesus Christ, His imputed righteousness to us, that we have the blessing. And that comes through the Holy Spirit inside of every believer. It fulfills the righteousness of the law. I had much more to say to get started, but we're already there. So just go with me to verse 5. Walking with or without the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For they that are after, those who depend on the flesh, doing things on your own in your own thought process, do mind, do set the mind, do focus upon, do think this way on things of the flesh. But they that are after, those that depend on the Spirit, those that depend on the Holy Spirit in their life, Set the mind, control their thoughts on the things of the Spirit. Have you heard the gospel message? Most of you would say, yes. But guess what? We always need to hear it again. God created everything. It was good. Roman, excuse me, Genesis 1. Genesis 2, God talks about the special creation of man. In fact, in 2.7 it says, God took the dust of the ground and He formed it together and He blew in it the breath of life and man became a living soul, right? And we have these special responsibilities given to man and woman above all other creation. That's the way God created and designed that we are going to have a part in relationship with Him and a relationship with all of the world because of it. Then Genesis 3, sin enters the world. And sin's penalty is separation from that relationship with God. It is the downfall. And there's all kinds of results. Read chapter 3 of, of Genesis to see those results. We have childbirth and pain with, with ladies. We have men that now have to work until they die on this earth. And all of these other things that come. But most especially, we're separated from our relationship with God because of sin. But God right then in Genesis 3.15 has a promise that He's going to make a way for that separation to be fixed. The void to be removed. The penalty of sin to be paid. And He says in there that He talks about a, a snake, that serpent that's going to bite a heel and the heel that is going to tread on the head of the snake. But He's pointing towards sending Jesus Christ as our Messiah, our Savior, our Lord. We see that when we get all of the Old Testament prophecies pointing towards Jesus and we see in the New Testament what Jesus did. The penalty of sin is death. There's death, sickness, decay, destruction, all kinds of bad things because of sin. It is the penalty of sin. But Jesus has made a way. God has made a way through Jesus for that penalty to be fixed, to be paid. Jesus Christ, the perfect the perfect man coming from God, walking in our bodies in human flesh, walking perfectly, went to the cross and died the last sacrifice for the penalty of sin. Penalty paid. The devil thought he had won, but the story was just beginning. We know Jesus overcame death three days later in the resurrection by the power of the same very Spirit that Paul is talking about in the book of Romans that is ava available to everybody who believes in what God has designed, what God has put in place. That those who believe in what Jesus Christ has done and in Christ alone for their salvation, those who receive that and believe that they receive the Holy Spirit inside of them. This is the gospel message or a piece thereof. And then we get to a verse like this that is speaking now the, the Spirit. Paul is going to bring in the, the, the whole thing about the Spirit and, and the walking of flesh and Spirit. And he says in verse 5, For they that are after the flesh, those who think fleshly, um, do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Have you clearly heard the gospel message? Have you answered that call of the Holy Spirit in understanding the truth of what God has put in place, what the penalty of sin is, and our only way of salvation is through the Savior, Jesus Christ? It's the only way. Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, understanding that what Jesus Christ did 
on the cross is enough. Nothing else. If the answer is yes, then listen to me. The Holy Spirit is present in your life. The Holy Spirit comes into your life when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says we're a new creature. If you be in Christ or Christ in you, you are a new creature. What is new about us? We didn't get a new body. We don't get a new soul because our soul is eternal. We get a new spirit, and it is the Holy Spirit. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 11 through about verse 13, it gives us that understanding that we heard the Word of God. The Holy Spirit had called, gave us understanding. We chose to believe, and we are sealed with the Holy Spirit, the earnest of God's promise, right? The Holy Spirit is in every believer. And if you remember, for the third time in Philippians 1, 6, it says, Being confident in this very thing, that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So if you've heard the gospel message, you've understood it because the Holy Spirit brought that clarity to you. You've answered through faith in accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Then the Holy Spirit, the same Spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, lives inside of you. And God has started something in you. If the Holy Spirit is inside of you, God has started something in you. And the promise is, is He will finish it. He will complete it. So we get to a scripture like this in verse 5. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. And then it talks about this thinking in verse 6 and 7. But before we get there, let me just say this. If you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit is present in your life. And if the Holy Spirit is present in your life, you know salvation has come to your home. If you do not believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit is not inside of you. And right now you are spiritually dead. It's just that there's no in-between. You're spiritually alive or you're spiritually dead. And the spiritual life or spiritual death is eternal. Okay? It's not about these fleshly bodies right now. We are all made in, in Genesis 2-7. Man became a living soul. Souls are eternal. We're all going to be eternal creatures. And one day, we're all going to be believers in Jesus Christ. But it is about where we're going to spend that eternity. But even with that, I want you to, to understand as we sit here, application number one, if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. Know that. The Holy Spirit inside of every believer is God's promise and earnest that we have eternal life. We need to take that out of our worry. We have to know, okay, I'm in. God has already saved me. The eternal life also does not begin after we die on this earth. The moment we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, the very moment that His Holy Spirit comes inside of us, His Holy Spirit makes us alive. We have a new life. At that time, you are alive by the Spirit of God, not by any works of your own. We are alive at that second, and we are alive for eternity with Him forever. And nothing can separate us from the love of God. We've got to know that to live this life the way God has called us to live. Hear what the Word of God is saying. If we're saved, we have life and we have it from the moment we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And if you're not saved, you are dead. It's just how it is. Verse 8 Skip verse 6 and 7. We're going to come back to that. In verse 8, it says this, So that they that are in the flesh cannot please God. They don't have the Spirit inside of them, so there's no way to please God. Verse 9, But you're not in the flesh, you're in the Spirit. So be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Did you, did you get that? Paul's talking to Christians. He's talking to believers. He's saying, if you believe, you have the Spirit inside of you. You have eternal life. But if you do not believe, you do not have the Spirit of God inside of you, and you are none of His. It's very plain. Application number two. If you have not personally, 
on your own, on your own decision, on your own accord, you answering the call of the Holy Spirit in your life. If you have not personally made the decision to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are still in the flesh. You're in your own thinking. And there is no Spirit from God living inside of you. You are spiritually dead. It's just the truth of God's Word. So verse 8, if we're in the flesh, means we're without the Spirit. We cannot please God because on our own accord, we just can't please God. In our flesh, we cannot please God. It's all by God's power in His Spirit that lives inside of us. Verse 10, he goes on to say, And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is, what's that word, by the way? Life. If Christ be in you, the Holy Spirit's presence, the body is dead because of sin. These sinful bodies are going to die. You know, our, our resurrected bodies are not going to be these bodies. I just want to bring that to you, all right? I know you all want to look just like Carney, but you're never going to look just like Carney. <laughs> who, who wants to keep their same body, by the way? It is certainly not me. <laughs> I want that new body. He, he tells us, if Christ be in you, verse 10, the body is dead because of sin. These bodies are on their way to destruction and decay and death. They're going to die, but the Spirit is life. It's life because of righteousness, because what God has done, not what we've done. He tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, we're a new creature. And if we read the rest of that 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 17 through 21, he tells us that our unrighteousness has been removed from us. It went to Christ, nailed to the cross, penalty paid. And at the same time that we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 21, that Christ's perfect righteousness has been imputed to us who believe. You see, that's the Spirit of God living inside of every believer. And that, my friends, brings us life. You are alive eternally, forever, the day you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the day His Holy Spirit comes inside of you. In fact, it says in verse 11, But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Christ from the dead dwell in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken. Quicken means make alive your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwell in you. That's the same Spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is promised inside of every believer. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, towards the end, it tells us that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. God lives inside of every believer by His Spirit. Application number three, you are made alive for eternity the moment the Holy Spirit comes inside of you. Nobody, nothing can separate that from you. Now, I want to go back to verse 6 and 7 in our thinking. If you are not saved, remember, if you've not accepted the truth of the gospel, then the Spirit is not inside of you. Your mind is in the flesh, period. It's how you think. It's what can I do? What does the world say? It is totally worldly. However, if you're saved... You now have a choice in how you're going to think. God doesn't make you think a certain way, but He now gives you the power and the truth to be able to start training your thinking. Paul uses this as set the mind or have your mind on things. It means to, to think a certain way in how we think. And um, some just, just very clear in this thinking, that as we're saved, we are a babe in Christ, we still see things kind of the same way we did before, but the Spirit is now inside of us. He's trying to grow us. But if we're not careful, we'll still look back to the way we have thought before, and that's thinking as a babe in Christ, it's thinking in the flesh. And the Apostle Paul is really talking here about the power of the Spirit has made you alive and there's this growth, this Christian sanctification that should be taking place. And it was exactly the conversation in, in Sunday school this morning. 
And uh, as I look at this, we have a choice. The Holy Spirit is presence in us. In us, we have the power to choose whether we set the mind on things of the flesh, try to analyze and think just the way the world would or flesh would, or do we set the minds in the truth of God's Word? Do we see the world from the way God sees the world in His Word? You see, that's setting the mind more and more on the Spirit. It's not about whether we believe or not. If you believe Jesus Christ is your Savior, all right, if you've accepted Him as your Savior, then you're saved. The Holy Spirit's inside of you. If you don't believe the Holy Spirit's not, and you'll only think worldly. That's settled. We're past that. Now let's grow. We're babes in Christ, or we're on this Christian journey, but how do we see things? I believe how we exercise this choice is dependent on where we are in our spiritual growth. Am I going to think by setting the mind on the flesh, or am I going to think by setting my mind on the Spirit? Let's look at verse 6 and 7. For to be carnally minded, that's fleshly minded, is death. If I only think about what I can do or what the flesh can do, it leads to death. It doesn't, it doesn't lead to the power of God, although if we're saved, we're saved forever. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. You have a choice. I have a situation in front of me. Do I want to look at it carnally, which leads to nothing good? It leads to death, physical death. Or do I want to look at the Spirit, which leads to life and peace? I have a choice in every situation. How I'm going to think. He goes on in verse 7. Because the carnal mind, if we're thinking earthly, if we're thinking just by what man or woman can do on their own, it's an actually enmity against God. When we think of what I can do on my own, absent of God with me, I am an enemy of God. How do you like that? That's what's being said. Because I'm thinking, I can do it. And what I miss is my need for the Savior. Wherever you are, in whatever is going on, do you see your need for a Savior? I feel like I'm not living up to what God has called me to be. I want to do this better. Do you realize your need for a Savior. You can't do better, but Jesus can do better through you. You see, that's the power of His Spirit. I, I want to do this, but I end up doing that. Remember Paul's conversation? The only way I can do what God has called me to do is for me to understand the gospel message and my need for a Savior. Hannah's beautiful song was a reflection of our need for a Savior. And when we see what she did with such bravery and truth and word, we want God to mend our broken hearts to point us in His direction. We acknowledge our need for a Savior. You see, when we acknowledge that we cannot do it on our own, this, this need that, that we can't do anything without God, then we start to focus on spiritual thinking and not fleshly thinking. If we don't realize that we need the Savior, then we try to do it ourselves. So many times, and, and, and I think I've preached this incorrectly I've talked about walking in the Spirit so many times uh, in this very congregation, I know. And many times we equate that with walking in, in accordance with God's Word. You've got to do this right. You know, we've got to do all the things right. We, we've got to live godly, and that's true. We need to do all of those things. But we can do all of those things on our own. The starting place is an understanding that we are bankrupt without God in our lives. That if we depend on anything less than the Holy Spirit's power in our life, we're going to fail. That's the beginning of walking in the Spirit. Verse 6 and 7, to be carnally minded is death. Why is the carnal mind death? Because to think carnally is to be an enemy against God. To set the mind on what I can do or things of the flesh is totally against God's character and what God has designed and called us to do. Why? Because the flesh is not subject to the law of God. 
We think, I don't need God when I'm doing it myself. I can do it myself. But the flesh is unable to show a humbleness to who God is and what God has done. The flesh simply cannot love God. It's God's Spirit coming inside of us that helps us with that connection. Application number four. Believers are called to set the mind to intentionally think on things spiritually. Think according to Scripture, not according to flesh. Oh, there's so much just going in this mind up here. My little brain's overloaded. <laughs> but to set the mind spiritually actually starts humbly in acknowledging I can do nothing on my own. I can only do anything that is right, good, just, and lovely through the power of God working inside of me. It's a piece of the gospel. That without that, I'm living worldly and I'm not acknowledging what man has done in that, that man is separated from God of his own works. That we cannot do enough good. There's none righteous, no, not one. We all deserve death. But the gift of God has been eternal life. And that eternal life is the beginning of new life. We're a new creature. His Spirit inside of us, yes, wants us to walk in the Spirit, walk in accordance with God's Word, but not about following the rules. At a humbly beginning of understanding, I cannot achieve on my own. I cannot even breathe on my own. I can't even mourn on my own. I can only do it, first of all, in understanding. I am 100% bankrupt without Christ in my life. And when His Holy Spirit comes into mine in belief, I then have life instantly. Life and peace is promised. So many times in walking in the Spirit, we try to do it all right without accepting that we can't do it on our own. And it starts with humbly accepting the need for a Savior. <laughs> When we see we're bankrupt in front of God, totally dependent on Him, then we start to listen to that Holy Spirit. What does the Holy Spirit do for us? This is not an exhaustive list, just a few things. The Holy Spirit calls us to salvation. It indwells in us. It seals us. He assists us in prayer. He comforts us. He fills us with joy and peace. He causes us to overflow with hope. He leads us into righteousness. He gives us gifts. He convicts the world of sin. He testifies of who Jesus Christ is. He brings us wisdom. These are just a, a snapshot of the many things that the Holy Spirit does when He's inside of our life. But He's a gentleman. He won't force us to see any of this. But when we decide to grow past being a babe in Christ, looking at the world just by what I can do, and we realize I can do nothing without Him, when we start to look at things spiritually, We've reached out in faith. We've accepted Jesus Christ in faith according to His Word and the leading of the Spirit. So we walk more and more in that faith in the leading of the Spirit. And we grow from a babe to a small child in Christ, to a young adult in Christ, to an adult in Christ, to an older adult in Christ, never being perfected until that day that He calls us home. That's God's design. I ask you this, number one, have you for sure on your own accord with an understanding of the gospel message and your need for a Savior, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And if you have not, 
There is no reason for you to go out this door today or to be listening online and not accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. It is the beginning. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit is not in you. It's not there. And you have none of the power of God inside of you. You are totally worldly, totally fleshly in what is going on. You're relying on your own power. And you know by your own experience that it leads to failure over and over again. Number two, if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. You have new life. You have an imputed righteousness of God. God has promised that what He started in you, He will finish. He will grow you, but He won't rush you. And so growing in Him first starts with us understanding our need for Him over and over and everything we should see that we need Jesus. And from there, in faith that we've accepted Jesus, now in faith I will start to walk more and more according to His Word and we'll be walking in the Spirit. Look, every time we think we don't do something right is actually a glorious time. It's a time for us to say, oh God, thank you for reminding me I need you. I was about to do this on my own and it wouldn't have had anywhere near the power that it's going to have now that you are in the middle of my mess. And let us proclaim him in the middle of our mess. You know, with, with a church member this week, we, we, were, we were on the phone in prayer talking, and, and I'm coming to an end. I'll just say there was a lot of challenge. There's a lot of things going on in this person's life. And to the point that I said, as I come and will, you know, if I talk to you, I'll say, well, how do you want me to pray for you today? I don't even know. Well, hey, let's just praise him then. Let's just praise him. And that's what we did. And it led into about a 15-minute praise session between three people and a phone call. But you know who else was there? The Holy Spirit was there. And it was all over. We forgot what the problems were. And we never prayed for a single one. <laughs> because we praised Him. We understood the need of the Savior in it all. And we were able to just give it to Him. You know, all of us need more days like that, don't we? We're where we just praise Him. No matter what's going on, we praise Him. And you know, at the end of the day, He's going to handle most of our problems without us ever even asking. We should communicate with Him. But let God be God. And let us understand our need. Would you stand as I pray? Heavenly Father, I come to You this morning and I thank You. God, You, you took what what I had prepared and you just did something else with it and I thank you for that God I thank you for allowing your spirit to lead and not only in what I spoke but in what was heard and I know as much as everybody heard the message today they also heard something individual they heard something for them and God I, I just thank you that your word is alive it's alive right now today as we speak about it and it's powerful and God, your spirit is powerful. The same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is in every believer and is present in this very place today. And God, I can't help but believe that your spirit is calling upon lives right now. So God, if there is someone here today who has not accepted you as their Lord and Savior, where they know on their own that they have made this decision absent of anyone else, God, that you, the Holy Spirit, has brought the truth of the gospel and their need for a Savior, and they've never accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, would they do that right now? If you are present today, would you step out and come forward, and may we celebrate together. And God, if, if there's somebody here who has just been struggling in their own insecurities, they feel like a failure. They feel like they haven't been able to do this right or that right. Their relationships are, are stressed. The job is a stress. There's just these complications in life. Maybe physically they have something going on, God, and, and in our own way we've been having our own pity party, God. May we just come to an understanding we are bankrupt without you. May we come to you in acknowledging, God, we need you. We need Jesus Christ in our life. God, if there's someone that you are laying that upon their heart, would they just come up and may we pray and may we celebrate together. God, for our 
brothers and sisters in every seat right now and those that are listening online or will listen at some time in the future, may they understand to walk in the Spirit means first of all to accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior for the Spirit to even be present and that's a promise by your word. And just as we receive that promise by your grace and our faith, God, that if we will acknowledge our need for you over and over, we will walk more and more in your spirit. You will guide us. You will lead us. You will grow us. And God, we will get to a point we won't desire milk, but we'll want meat. We'll want to know more about your word. We'll want to live totally in your word, not because we're trying to please you, God, but because it's our desire. It's where we want to be. It's following your spirit. God, I ask you to help us live this life fulfilled for you so we can be a shining example of you. May our life be a mirror of the gospel. May people look to you because of our life. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If I can help you in any way, would you come forward today after service? And if not, God bless you. Small groups tonight at 6 o'clock. And ladies, meeting, kickoff tomorrow night at 6.30, right? 6.30. God bless you.